everybody. It's so nice to see you back at today's Our Studio Community Meetup. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, and this is your first meetup, I'm Rachel calling in from Boston today. It's, ni it's so nice to meet you. Feel free to introduce yourselves through the chat window and say hello as well. I love getting to see where people are calling in from all over the world and to also see people sharing helpful resources with each other there in the chat too. I host these meetups every Tuesday at noon Eastern time, and they are all recorded and shared up to the RStudio YouTube if you ever want to go back and check out past sessions too. It will be the same exact link that you joined the meetup from today, that same YouTube link. Um, if this is your first meetup, this is a friendly meetup environment for teams to share different use cases with each other and teach lessons learned. Together, we're all dedicated to making this an inclusive and open environment for everyone, no matter your experience, industry, or background. You can add the whole calendar of events or individual events to your own calendar um, with a link that I'll show on the screen here in just a few minutes. Oh, here we go, I'll show it now. You can use this link to find out about any upcoming events for a heads up about next week, we will have Julia Silgi and Isabel Zimmerman with us here next Tuesday to talk about ML Ops with, with Vetiver in Python and R. Today, I am so excited to have you all here for our sports analytics meetup with the NFL Big Data Bowl 2022 winners led by Robin, Brendan, Riker, and Elijah all here with me today. I've seen a lot on Twitter and LinkedIn about their team, and I'm excited for us all to be able to ask them questions here today as well. So during the event, you can ask questions on YouTube, live where you're watching from, and are also able to ask anonymous questions as well uh, through rstd.io slash meetup questions, which I'll put on the screen here too. With that, I would love to pull everybody up on stage. Let me do this one by one here. Here we go. <laughs> and Robin, Brendan, Riker, Elijah, thank you so much for, for joining here today. Uh, Robin, Brendan, Riker, and Elijah are all graduate students in statistics at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. They each have a passion for sports analytics and enjoy applying their stats knowledge to the game. First off, I want to congrat say congratulations and thank you so much for being here to share your experience with us today. I will pull the slides up here as well and turn it over to you all. All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our presentation. We're extremely excited to be able to share our work with you all today. So today we'll be presenting on our 2022 NFL Big Data Bowl Grand Champion winning project. We'll provide details on the math behind the path and introduce some upgrades we've made since the conclusion of the competition. So SFU has been a sports analytics powerhouse for years. Professors such as Tim Schwartz and Luke Bourne have attracted students who have a passion for both statistics and sports. Together, they have re revolutionized the department and have helped students land jobs with professional teams such as the Seattle Kraken, LA Rams, Sacramento Kings, Vancouver Canucks, and many, many more. SFU's Big Data Bowl success started in 2019, where a team of students won the college competition and were again finalists in 2021. Their work really inspired us to continue on the SFU tradition, and their mentorship helped us throughout the entire process. So before we get into the project, let's meet the team. So my name is Riker. I am a current Master's of Statistics student at SFU. I formerly interned with the Vancouver Canucks of the NHL and am currently an intern with the Detroit Lions of the NFL. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Robin. I'm a PhD candidate uh, at Simon Fraser University and I'm focusing on revolutionizing the game of curling with analytics and machine learning tools. Um, in addition to the Big Data Bowl, I was part of the winning team of the Big Data Cup this year. Uh, so for that, we use tracking data to evaluate passing in women's Olympic hockey. Hi, everyone. My name is Brendan. I'm currently a master's student at Simon Fraser University um, and a data analyst and intern at Excellus Analytics. And uh, I also won the Big Data Cup just a year before Robin in the 2021 competition, 
where I worked with a few others in building out a expected possession value model for hockey. So evaluating every single um, event in a play. And hi, my name is Elijah. I'm also a master's of statistics student at SFU, and I'm currently an intern with the Pittsburgh Pirates. All right. For those of you who are unfamiliar, here's a quick overview of last year's Big Data Bowl competition. So this was the competition's fourth year, and the subject was chosen to be on special teams. Special teams includes uh, plays like punt returns, kick returns, field goals, and extra points. We were provided data from three NFL seasons, including next-gen stats tracking data, PFF advanced scouting data, and other basic stats from the NFL. In total, there were $100,000 in prizes awarded to three college and five open finalists. And then we were lucky enough to be named the grand champions out of these eight finalists. So now for a bit of inspiration behind the project. This is an entry into this year's 2022 Big Data Bowl by Zach Rogers, and this gives good motivation for our work. It puts you in the shoes of the punt returner. If you can imagine that you are the punt returner, what should you look for after receiving the punt? Our project aimed to answer a couple of these main questions. So firstly, are returners making good decisions to increase yards? Are they finding optimal gaps, assessing tackle risk, and are they using their teammates and following their blocks? Secondly, we wanted to determine who was the best at evaluating their decision. Could we rank returners, which could then allow coaches to determine the best returners based on a given situation? Now I'll toss it over to Robin and Brendan, and we'll go over uh, some more details of the project. Cool, thank you. So now that we know what the punt returner needs to consider and what our goals are, we want to be able to find show the best path to the end zone, like we see in green on the figure here. The observed path is shown in black. The returner and his team are shown in yellow and gray, while the kick team players are shown in pink. So the first step in building our optimal path is to find gaps in the kick team's coverage. For this, we used Delaney triangulation. So this is a mesh-like structure that connects the points such that all players in the hull are all connected uh, to form triangles with no lines overlapping. This is shown with the purple lines between any two kick team players. And to account for the punt returner going around all the players and towards the sidelines, we add new gaps that connect the players on the outside of the hull to the boundaries of the zone of interest. So these are shown by the vertical and horizontal purple lines here. Some of the interesting packages we use are tri mesh and neighbors from the tri pack family. And now that we have this optimal, or I'm um, sorry, <laughs> these windows to find that the punt returner can move through on his way towards the end zone, we want to move towards quantifying the pressure along each of these windows. And we do this using our penalized expected arrival time algorithm. To give a bit of visual intuition behind this algorithm, if you look at that heat line in the top left of the plot here, um, you could see that towards the sideline, it's colored green, indicating that there's a lot of open space there and it's gonna take the members of the kicking team a long time to get to that position. While as you move closer and closer to where all the players are, you can see that it goes from green to yellow to red, indicating that there's more pressure and less time for the punt returner to move through that area. And to kind of formalize this a little bit more, the goal of this algorithm is to obtain the minimum time we expect it to take a member of the kicking team in red here, to reach a target location as indicated by the X here. And we're gonna take a bunch of different target locations, but let's just focus on this single spot right here. So with that target location, we're gonna look at every kicking team player on the field or every player in red that's trying to stop the punt returner from moving forward. And let's or say we just look at number 97, for example, to, to start off here. Um, so with number 97, what we're going to do is we're going to create a straight line connecting him to that target location. And once we do that, we're going to find all blockers that we can project onto this straight line at a 90 degree angle. And that's going to sort of be all of the blockers that can really reasonably impede his path from getting to that target location. So here we have number 82 and number 19. And for these blockers, we're going to take two different measurements. So first we're gonna take the length of that projection from 82 to the straight line. 
as indicated by B1 here. And that's going to be a measure of the lateral distance from the kicking team player. And then we're going to take the distance from number 97 to that projection. And that's going to be indicated by D2 here. And that's sort of the forward distance from the kick and team player to the blocker. And with these two measurements, we're going to attribute time penalties for each of the blockers using what we call a projected Gaussian kernel. And that's characterized by the equation right here and the heat map below. And sort of what we're trying to do here is to create an equation where um, we're kind of accurately capturing how much a blocker is likely to impede um, a, a member of the kicking team's path to that target location, right? So you can see here that when you're very close and right in front of number 97, you're gonna impose a very high penalty. Whereas as you move further and further out, you can be a bit more lateral from the, the kicking team player or from number 97, but you, you have less of a penalty overall, right? Because if you're, say you're right in front of number 97, like one foot forward from him, but five feet to the left, then you're less likely to actually catch, or catch him or impede him than if you're, say, 10 feet forward from him and five feet to the left. And once we assign these blocker penalties, we're going to simply add them all up. Uh, so with number 19 and number 82, they impose a 0.54 and 0.31 second penalty on number 97, respectively, giving us a total penalty of 0.85 seconds by these two blockers. Uh, and then we're going to calculate the expected time to the target location for uh, number 97, given that he runs at a straight line speed of seven yards per second. And that's going to be 2.34 seconds. Then we add these two values up. So the time that we expect him to take to get to that target location unimpeded as 2.34 and the blocker penalty that we expect to happen as 0.85. And that's going to give us 3.19 seconds for number 97 to that target. And we're going to repeat this process over and over for every member of the kicking team. And on the left here, you can see we have a little table with the top few players here. And number 17 is the quickest to get to that target location at 0.92 seconds in this, in this case. Um, and that's sort of, that's going to be our measure of the time we expect a member of the kicking team to get to that location or our penalized expected arrival time. And we're going to repeat this process over and over for up to 20 evenly spaced points along each of these windows. So on the, so that's where we get that sort of heat line map on the left here, where you can see, or where we're basically just taking a bunch of different targets and we're smoothing them out to get a nice, um, these nice kind of color transitions over each of the windows. And now I'll pass it back over to Robin to talk about how we go from this penalized expected arrival time me measure to actually finding the optimal path through the defenders. Great, so now that we have our mesh structure and a weighting system for it, we need to find a way to get the punt returner to the end zone. And to do this, we use the A star search algorithm. So it works a little bit like a GPS and just finds the safest route while avoiding traffic. Our algorithm looks at a heuristic function, which defines how many yards are remaining from the target to the end zone, and a cost function. This cost function describes the distance between the punt returner and the target, the danger associated with the target point, as well as how risky of a target the punt returner may be willing to consider traveling to. The algorithm looks at various possible routes and restarts whenever the total of the heuristic and cost function become too large. We can uh, set a few constants to help us uh, with the trade-off between risk and reward for the punt returner. So today we're gonna really focus on the alpha term and see how changing it might uh, adjust this trade-off between risk and reward. So for our submission, if you have, if you had the chance to look at it, uh, we used alpha of 0 0.5. So we consider this to be a good mixture of risk and reward for a punt returner wanting to gain yards while still avoiding the tackle, avoiding injury, stuff like that. If we were to change alpha to be one, the path considers only yards remaining to the end zone with no care of the danger of being tackled. So this would mean that you're going basically straight to the end zone and hopefully that you can push everyone out of the way. Uh, and then setting alpha to zero finds the safest path available without considering if it's really gonna bring you 
closer to the end zone. So this typically will send you along the sidelines and push you the rest of the way. And now that we have this optimal path defined, um, let's just take a look at a case here where we set alpha to equal to 0.5. And we want to compare the optimal path versus our, or the actual observed path for the part return. And to do that, we look over the next five yards for each of the paths. So as you can see on the top right here in the visual, we have sort of the highlighted uh, black and green line over the next five yards. And we want to calculate the Frechet distance over this, this time. Um, and Frechet distance is a measure of difference between two paths, where essentially, intuitively, you could think of it as one path being a man, the other path being a dog. And the Frechet distance is the minimum length of a leash you need to traverse from one end of the paths to the other end. And uh, you can see visually, uh, a bit of visual intuition behind this. Uh, with the blue lines here, you can see that sort of like steps along each of these paths. And the teal line there is another step, but it's just the step where the length is maximized. And that's sort of the minimum length of a leash that you would need to traverse from both ends. And uh, with this Frechet distance, we also have to take into account a couple of other things. Um, just in case there are cases where there's less than five yards remaining in either the observed or the optimal path. So if there aren't, so if both paths are more than five yards, then we just simply calculate the crochet distance and that's sort of our measure of deviation from the uh, optimal path in that moment. Um, but if either of the paths are between one and five yards, then we're going to multiply the crochet distance by five and divide it by the minimum of those two, the minimum length of those two paths to sort of scale up and account for the fact that um, that path, we aren't really seeing a full five yard movement. So we're trying to um, kind of counteract that. And if there's less than one yard on either of the paths, then we omit the calculation since we don't really have enough information to see how the punt returner was moving relative to the optimal path. And yeah, with, with this optimal path algorithm, we also just wanted to give a quick shout out to some of the key R functions that really helped us in this process. Um, so first up, nest and map were super helpful for making this whole process very tidy and clean and, um, and being able to apply large scale analysis to, uh, using very complex operations within just a single data frame. So nest essentially allows you to group say you want to group the data by moment or by each frame of the play, where a frame is simply just a moment in time, um, but you have 20 rows of player locations. If you group by the, play or, uh, by the frame, then you can sort of nest the data into a column of data frames, which includes all of the player locations. So you have one row per frame, but within that row, you have sort of a, a data frame of all of the player locations. Um, and then with the map function, you can start applying different functions to that data. So you can apply um, basically functions to find the windows for the part return to move through or calculate the penalized expected arrival time or find the uh, optimal path with the A star algorithm using this map function all within one data frame. And future map is just um, an evolution beyond map where you can parallelize the code so it runs a bit quicker. And dplyr, of course, was super helpful for us just with building out sort of a tidyverse pipeline with key functions like mutate, uh, select, and filters, and also the pipe operator making the code nice and sleek. Um, then, of course, our, our, all of our plots here are made with ggplot and gganimate. And um, it's, those packages are just super awesome for making very nice, aesthetically pleasing plots with very little effort. And, so we will yeah, pause we'll... for a second for questions, if there are any about kind of the key content of what our submission optimal path was. Yeah, I can see a question that came over from Slido. And just a, rem a reminder that you can ask questions over on Slido, and I'll just put up the link right now on the screen. Um, so you can ask questions there anonymously, or you can ask through YouTube Live too. Um, but one of the questions that came up was, I'll put it on the screen. Do you think being in a general statistics graduate program was beneficial to your work as opposed to more specific like data science or sports analytics? That's a good question. There might be debates there. Um, 
I think like, so we'll talk a little bit later, um, but for our work, a key aspect in, in building a team um, is definitely to have a good variety of backgrounds. So having someone who is like a statistics graduate to really understand like the models and what's going on behind it is great. If you could get like a computer scientist on there, um, they're super efficient and can write code probably a lot faster than a lot of us stats folk. Um, yeah, but it's definitely good to have always someone on your team with a stats background to understand what's going on. Um, but a mixture of, of various backgrounds and, and departments and origin stories is always, always great to see. That's great. Thank you. One other question I see over on Slido, I'll put on the screen here is, um, did you calculate uh, P or PEAT at just a single point in time at catch or at multiple points during the return? Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, we, we calculated the P basically at every single frame of the play. Um, and then for our big data ball submission, we were sort of taking the median over the entire play, just because there are a few frames where say a punt returner is running in a path that's maybe not the optimal path by our algorithm, but also a very good option. Then after a few frames, the optimal path should adjust to that. But during that time when they are running and the optimal path is telling them to go a different way, it is it has quite a big Frisch deviation. So the median, or we took the median to sort of account for that and adjust for the fact, sort of for our naivety and that there could be two different very great, great options. Um, so that's what we were doing for the big data bowl, but we've also played around with metrics. We're looking at it just right at catch, um, taking the mean, looking at, say, the frame where there's the first forward movement, um, and just different metrics like that. But yeah, basically, we can calc calculate it over every frame. And I will maybe take, cut yeah. in and add a little yeah. bit. <laughs> the question's sure. about Pete, and you're asking, answering for shade deviation. Oh, yeah. For shade no, deviation, we do oh, the median. Sorry. Pete is yeah, just like yeah. calculated all the time, all over the place. Yeah. Can you remind me what <laughs> he is too? Yeah, so the Pete is basically like, um, I'll go back to that heat map that we had or the little heat lines here. So this is the penalized expected arrival time um, along each of the windows here. Sorry, it's a little bit early in the morning in Pacific right now. <laughs> but yeah, here's um, along each of the windows. This is the peak here. So it's sort of like the measure of how long it will take the part or how long it will take the kicking team to get to that location, like any of these locations. Whereas the for shade deviation is sort of, um, it's how much the punt returner is deviating from the optimal path. So yeah, we, we calculate everything at every single frame. Thank you. Um, I see a few other just comments to say extremely impressive work, but we'll hold some of the other questions until the next stopping point, if that works for you. For sure. Okay, so. All right, let me fix, let me fix our screen here. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> there we go. Um, Okay, so to make our work uh, a little bit more interactive, uh, we built a Shiny app so that everyone here today can have a look at our optimal path um, on any return that you might wanna see throughout all the years of the data that we have. Um, so as the user, you can select the season, the returner, the play, and set the risk alpha that you want uh, the punt returner to consider when making his optimal path, I guess. Um, so you can look at the return at any point along the way by hitting the play button in the top right corner, um, or you can use the slider bar to look at any specific point along the return. Uh, so you're given a description of what the return uh, looks like or what the return actually achieved. Uh, and then you have the option to save it as the image of the individual frame that you're looking at. You can save the GIF of the entire return or the data that's behind the return if you want to look at it and play with it yourself. Uh, so maybe we'll look at the McCall Hardman, or we can go live. So let's let's go live and have a bit oh, of fun. Sorry, <laughs> that's fine. Um, cool. So Brendan will reload our app. Um, so maybe don't try to log on right away because we want to make sure we're efficient for you guys. Uh, so we can start off by picking a year. Let's pick 2020, maybe. 
Um, and then if anyone in the comments, do you have like a favorite punt returner that you might want to see from the 2020 season? Feel free to comment now. <laughs> Give it a second. Come on, I know somebody wants to put someone in there. <laughs> you can do it anonymously too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't see anyone. All right, Eli, do you have a favorite? I hear uh, General Olszewski is good, if I did butcher his name. <laughs> sure, we can go for General Olszewski. Oh, here's one, uh, Isaiah uh, McKenzie. You wanna switch to him? Okay, is there a specific game that you like for, for this returner? So oh. there's, oh, there's only one. <laughs> we will go with that. Okay, um, Brendan, you wanna read their description? Yeah, for sure, yeah. So in, on this punt return, um, it looks like Half took a 55-yard punt return to, or he made a 55-yard punt uh, to Isaiah McKenzie who ran 84 yards for a touchdown. So I guess we nice. have a good player. So, wait, 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 <laughs> wait, don't dinner. Okay, so. Now, like, consider that type of a play. You have a big punt return. What quarter are we in? We're kind of small here. I can make it bigger. Uh, so we're in quarter. the second quarter, five, it's almost six minutes in. So where do we think we should put our alpha? Should we be consider it risky? Or I guess if you went 84 yards, it's probably something a little risky. So what do we like? Maybe 0.7 we can? I'd say put it in Point seven or point eight. Let's do point seven or point eight. Okay, so we can generate it, and then it takes a little bit of time because there's a whole lot of math going on, as you as you saw us go through before. Um, so it's working on the A starter search algorithm. There's a loading bar, so you know that you at least hit the button, and you don't have to click it a bunch of times. Um, and then we'll see the entire um, image of the return come up. Uh, and then in the top right, it'll have the slider bar. So it'll update and tell you how long of the, the return actually lasted. You can play through it where it'll just kind of do like a little slideshow of, of each frame of the play. Hopefully being screen sharing isn't stealing all of Brendan's computer juice. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, yeah, it's a longer return, so it's going to take a while to, to generate longer ones. The shorter ones are, are pretty fast. Is there any other questions, Rachel, to, to fill our, our next five seconds? <laughs> one question that I had was, like, thinking about people getting started if, with the Big Data Bowl for 2023, and you just have all of this data, how do you narrow down what you want to focus on? Yeah, so typically, um, so we're not sure what they're going to announce this year for the Big Data Bowl, but I think they're leaning towards having a top, a general topic each year. So for us, it was punt returns. So this year, who knows what it might be. Um, but yeah, just like, definitely you start by just like, looking at the data, seeing what you can find um, and playing around, make some histograms, make some pie charts, anything you can do just to understand the data. It's going to be a lot of data and a really hard to run. So often just like looking at a couple plays or one good play, make sure everything works for that play before you scale it up to big. Cause some of our stuff, it would run, I think Riker was running stuff like overnight. And then if we had to like, find one error, you'd, you'd fix it, and then you'd go and run everything again overnight. <laughs> so it's, you don't want to start there. You want to start small, maybe which is with one good play and see what you can do. Yeah, and definitely, definitely, you know, we had kind of a broad topic with special teams. There was a lot of different ways we could go with it. Um, but figuring out what what's going to be useful as well in, in a football sense. Um, and then, like Robin said, kind of getting a general idea how the data looks, what's going to be possible, um, and then kind of running with it from there. Yeah. We definitely had a lot of other ideas, like are we going to do, you know, field goals, are we going to do this and that, and then it's just kind of trial and error and getting closer to, uh, to what you think is the best idea. Yeah. Okay, so our, our return is loaded. Brendan, maybe you want to 
playing around with, around with it. And yeah, so you can grab the slider bar, look, look at the whole frame or hit play and hopefully it loads somewhat smoothly. It tends to blink a little bit. Um, so right now it's just at like point, I think it updates at point 0.1 seconds. So it'll take a little while to get through this gigantic return. Um, but you can see the optimal path will update at every single frame. All the calculations are redone every frame. So it's a lot of data that you're really seeing right now. Um, working with tracking data is definitely a great experience. Like even if you're not ready to enter the big data bowl, maybe you don't have your star lineup ready play around with the data, like get used to working with tracking data is definitely something if you want to start a career in, in sports analytics, just getting those tools in, in your toolkit is, is definitely super useful. And then once the punt returner passes the final kick team player, all calculations kind of stop and we're just like, we just put a straight arrow as like book it to the end zone. Um, but obviously he still kind of has to run away and avoid anyone who's super fast. But yeah, it might be frozen now. Well, that's awkward. Oh. There was um, <laughs> other questions that came through when we asked uh, earlier too. And, and someone had asked, um, could you see potential for this being used real time somewhere down the line with increased processing power? Um, so one article I did see, um, come out in the summer. I think it was it was like the ultimate big data bowl recap. And for our year, it talked about creating the the ultimate submission would be like a combination of Zach Rogers, like put you in the punt returner like video game. And then you could see our optimal path like projected through all the players that you might be running towards so that you could actually learn from it in a video game sense would be like amazing <laughs> um so maybe if they could get it to that level and make like a, a video game for punt returners to learn as they're off the field would would be kind of wild for me <laughs> so one day maybe that's awesome i just definitely like, definitely I sorry to cut you. <laughs> sorry to cut you off rachel i was gonna say as well like kind of a uh, a post game or uh, a post game analysis of how you did as a returner. Um, so if the processing power is unfortunately not there uh, for an in-game thing, I think like a post-game analysis of of kind of of your performance or performances for punt returners across the league is I would be a great use for this. That's great. Um, one last question too that I saw come in a little, little bit earlier is someone asked, is it possible to share code for future reference? Um, for yeah. us, all of our code is on GitHub. Awesome. So we can share that link at the that the it's on their end slide, so we can you can Perfect. look at that thereafter. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so Richard, you can share the Shiny app link in the chat if you want for everyone to play around with. Um, so a little bit more, we'll go into the, the Smokehole Hardman return on the next slide. Um, so here we are going to show McCool Hardman's week 12 return against Tampa Bay, where we have an alpha of zero. So be as safe as possible, 0 0.5, kind of a good mix of risk and reward, and one, uh, which basically just says run straight to the end zone, plow through everyone if you need to. Um, so in our Big Data Bowl finals presentation, uh, we concluded that McCool Hardman was a fairly conservative player. And we can use our app to further analyze just how conservative he is. Uh, so if you want to play the GIFs. So the optimal path updates at each frame, constantly updating and adapting to the situation that McCall Hardman is facing, suggesting a new optimal path given each situation. And overall, McCall Hardman, um, we think, could use this tool to improve his return because a lot of his return is probably closest to a, a risk level of zero, which you know, we kind of want to gain yards as, as we do a return, but it depends on the scenario, right? He's a valuable player in his other, um, other role on the team. So it's, you kind of want to keep him safe at the same time. So things like that could influence how you might determine what alpha you might want to use.
Eli. Yeah, okay, so I'm going to take over now and talk about um, kind of what we ended up doing after the initial submission. So we go to the next slide. Yeah, so the uh, the task that the NFL gave us was to look at, uh, look at a specific team and try to find out how we could use the work we did to improve, you know, their results in the coming seasons. So we picked uh, Kansas City. So as you can see, like in 2018, they are really highly ranked in terms of, you know, average punt return yardage. And that kind of fell off in 2019 and 2020, which coincided with Tyreek Hill, um, the returner, being changed to McCall Harmon, who Robin just showed. And so after watching some of McCall Harmon's punts, we kind of we kind of chose the Chiefs as someone that we thought we could improve. And we can see why in this plot. So if you look at the McCall Harmon plot on the far right, he often kind of just goes towards the sidelines. He's not cutting up and you know running up. Um, up the middle of the field where there's obviously going to be more defenders, but you also have more blockers and there might be more space for you to maneuver. And we can kind of contrast him with the other three punt returners on the right who rank really highly in our expected uh, return yardage metric or, or just on average punt return yardage. They're, they're much stronger returners. You can see that by the really long uh, returns for some of them. And so the way we quantify that is by looking at, you know, their average yards gained per punt return versus their Frechet for path deviation. So the Frechet path deviation is kind of um, a concept of good decision making. So being close to the optimal path versus, you know, average yards gained per play is more of a just skill metric of, you know, it's dependent on how fast you are. And, and obviously the strength of your blockers uh, and the strength of the uh, of the kicking team. So we can look at McCall Par Hartman. He's kind of on the bottom right of that plot, which means he doesn't have a lot of skill and he's not making uh, great decisions. Um, and that's, you know, contrasting to the other three highlighted names who were the same, uh, who were the um, returners we saw on the last slide, who, who are very strong returners. And so the idea is, you know, if you decrease your first shape path deviation, you know, that might lead you to gaining uh, more yards on the average punt return. And so here are examples of, uh, of two different plays um, where we see, you know, when the in, the in the plot on the left with the green plot, when Hardman follows the optimal path or gets closer to it, he gets closer to what we might expect um, him to get in terms of expected yards versus on the right and on the plot on the red, he doesn't, you know, get really close to what we might have, uh, what we might expect using our expected pump return yardage metric. Uh, and that's because, you know, he's, his first shape path deviation is very, very large. I'll say maybe we should skip this questions for the end and just power through for time. Sounds good. Sure. All right. And then just talking about more generally, you know, how to um, have a good submission for the big data bowl. I think one of the biggest parts is, like Robin mentioned earlier, team formation, having a very diverse team with, you know, many different skill sets. You know, I, I come from more of like a math physics background, very different from the background that maybe Robin has, you know, doing an undergrad in stats. And so that helped us. We kind of brought different ideas to the table. And then, you know, brainstorming, you know, as Robin also mentioned earlier, making visualization. So, you know, exploratory data analysis, seeing what kind of data you have, what kind of paths might you go through uh, in terms of different projects. You know, just running with something and then not being afraid of scrapping it and going in a different direction if you see a better direction, uh, you know, as you're working. Doing research, looking at um, different sports is something that I think is one of the biggest things we, in the next slide, we'll show one of the concepts that we were kind of taking from a, a different sport, soccer. So using other sports, using other researchers there could be a great tool towards building a really nice project. And looking at previous big datable projects is obviously, you know, there's some great work there as well. And then, you know, trial and error and just being willing to adapt and uh, change your project and, um, yeah, work hard and have fun. Yeah, so here is kind of what I mentioned. So uh, originally, the kind of first idea we started with were these like stochastic convex hulls, which we kind of took as an idea from soccer. So we're kind of looking at, um, you know, uh, an area enclosed in a certain amount of uh, yards by the defenders and the 
uh, and the return team to kind of get an understanding for like kind of um, uh, field control, like what the kicking team and the punt and the returning team might have in terms of a field control and how that might we could use as a feature to might to to like you know create like an expected yards metric. And then you know as we we developed that idea, we moved forward. We started you know developing the a star search algorithm started developing the PAT. So that all kind of came out from this initial idea of, of the convex hulls. All right. So for any of you who are interested in the 2023 or beyond those big data bulls, um, this is what we kind of believe makes a good submission. So firstly, we think do a few things great rather than several things good. Um, the goal is really to stand out to the judges and we think this is kind of how you do that. Uh, second, have multiple ways to digest ideas. So this could be through uh, visuals, text, equations, titles, uh, or even captions. The third is to be really clear and concise with your project. So have a goal in mind. What problem are you trying to solve? Then determine the method. How are you going to solve this problem? And then apply it. It's really important for your project to be useful to the NFL and for you to explain how it could be useful. Lastly, have fun and learn as much as you can, uh, not only from your own project, but many, all of the many great submissions uh, every year. All right, so that's really everything we have for you guys today. Um, on the left there, we have QR codes that take you to our original submission, um, the GitHub page, like we mentioned earlier, as well as the Shiny app that we, uh, we showed you guys. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about our work um, and really wanna thank everyone for coming out today. And uh, obviously thank you, Rachel, for having us. Um, we'd be happy to answer any more questions that you guys may have. Thank you all so much. This is awesome. Really impressive. Especially just like being able to see it through all the animations too in the presentation was great. I'm going to go check over to Slido and see what questions we have. But just want to remind everybody, if you're watching now on YouTube, you don't have to use Slido. You can just comment in YouTube. Um, but you can ask questions anonymously on Slido too. And let me just pull that up on the screen right here. And we'll give people a few minutes to, to ask some other questions. I see Christopher and Brian saying amazing work, fantastic stuff in the chats on, the, on YouTube. I really like the way that you included like tips for people who are wanting to get started. Um, and was just thinking like on the last tip that you said, focus on like a few like great things <laughs> instead of like trying to do everything were there a few things that you had to narrow down to get to where you got uh, to the project now yeah i think we i think we had like kind of eli went over when we you know we kind of built it up from the ground up and had these like convex hulls and then developed it more into like the optimal path um and then once we got the idea for the optimal path and uh, Brendan and Robin kind of took the, the lead on that side, that became a real focal point for us. Um, so we did have a lot of those other like original ideas. We used those as features in our return of expected model, um, but they weren't as featured in the project. We really tried to hone in on the optimal path and make that the, the focal point. Mm -hmm. And definitely while you're working on your submission, I think for us, it was, mm -hmm. you're allowed up to 2000 words, um, which doesn't go a long way. <laughs> so like definitely having visuals that kind of explain what's going on too can save you a lot of time and space. Um, so you don't like, if you do too many small things, you won't be able to explain it um, near the extent it would deserve. So it's nice to be able to do this where it's like we can actually show people all of the hidden elements that they didn't get to see and and would never really know if we didn't go through this. I just remembered I wanted to show this um, link to the Kaggle 
uh, documentation you had shared with me too. I just made a short link to make it easier for people to, to access it. Um, but one other question that just came through on Slido was, what were the biggest challenges when going through the data? Um, first of all, the, the size of it, <laughs> um, how, how much was there, um, really trying to really trying to utilize like every piece that they provided for us, like trying to really diversify um, how we were building out the project. Um, but like I it got mentioned a few times throughout the, the presentation, the, the amount of the amount of tracking data is really the challenging, uh, really the challenging part. And then being able to turn that into our own, um, our own metrics was was also a challenge. Yeah, I can't yeah, remember I, if it was the NFL or somewhere else, but I think they're they have the ability to go like another ten times of a finer grain of tracking data, but they're just like, please don't. We do not have the the capacity to like to be able to even use that. Like it's too fine. So there are like hopefully they don't go too crazy, but it's a it's an interesting area to work with is the tracking data. Yeah, and with that too, I'd just like to say the NFL tracking data was probably the nicest data I'd work with and how clean it was and just easy to work with. Like there weren't really any errors. There might have been like one time I might have saw a player where two players had the same number, jersey number, but that's that's about it. Like it was pretty smooth. There were no discontinuities in uh, the tracking data at all, really. So it just made it so much easier to work with. Yeah, like Riker was mentioning size was the biggest issue just with dealing with all of this, these millions of rows of data, but actually having to clean up the data was super easy. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add definitely having like a team to work with can alleviate a lot of the challenges. Cause we like the way our project was, we approached our project was we split it up. And if you have a strong computer, you're doing the data cleaning. And if, if you have a weak computer, you're going to do the research. And we kind of like split up the different tasks that we had to face so that we could always have everyone doing something and progressing the project. That's great. Um, Elijah, I think you were going to say something. I didn't want to jump to the next question. No, I, I was going to actually just mention to Brendan like, and Robin, they've both done more like a uh, project with hockey tracking data and, you know, you have players kind of coming into the frame, then at leaving the frame and they kind of just appear and disappear sometimes out of magic versus, yeah, like with the NFL, uh, big datable data, like the, you know, the, the data is really, really clean. You know, we've really made it when you have people spamming your um, meetup as well. So congrats. <laughs> <laughs> um, but let's, let's see what other, um, what other questions. Oh, one question I did want to ask is, um, how do you get started working with player tracking data? Like, were there resources that you turned to? I think a lot of us had a bit of experience uh, prior to, um, whether it be in school or um, through internships or other just other projects. I know, like uh, was mentioned, you know, Brendan had worked with big, the big data cup the year before. Um, yeah, like I'm, I, I'm sure these guys have a, have some resources, but, um, for, for me, it was just kind of like diving right into it and figuring it out as you go. Yeah. I think for me, I'd only worked with event level data before going into this competition. Um, and just like the key thing that I really focused on and needed was like, I need the visual. I, like, I won't understand that it's working. <laughs> you can give me something, a bunch of numbers, but like, if I can have a visual to go with it, that like definitely helps with the understanding of what's going on like a million times. Yeah, yeah, I'd say, yeah, like along those lines, um, having good knowledge of Tidyverse and using those nest and map functions in GG Animate made it so much easier to understand the data because if you can kind of put it into this nice clean pipeline where you can break it down into like one row per frame or per player, or whatever you need, then you can just visualize it with GG Animate. It, it makes it so much easier to see what's actually going on rather than just looking at the data and seeing like X coordinate 
34 Y coordinate 43 or something. So that just made it way, way easier to kind of uh, get going and see where issues were happening if they were happening. Cool. So get started with GG Animate. Is that what you Yeah. <laughs> Let me just jump over. There's a few other questions on Slido. Um, let me copy them over to the screen here. Okay. This one is, in terms of all your data inputs, do you see this extending to performance data like expected speed, fatigue, et cetera, perhaps from practice? Yeah, yeah, I think um, one thing that we talked about quite a bit is sort of like a, a lot of comments that we got were around just with um, our, our optimal path algorithm, really what we're trying to optimize is just gaining yards. But there's a lot else going on in the play, like a player could get hit and fumble the ball, get injured. So there's like, I guess that's one thing that our algorithm doesn't really take into account. Um, in terms of like expected speed, we're also working on right now incorporating player speeds into our optimal path algorithm too. So with that, like you can maybe look at, say, McCole Hardman, a lot of the times he was running to the sideline, but he is pretty fast. So incorporating that into the data might might make the optimal path shift a bit more towards what he was doing um, in certain cases. So that that's one thing where I, I think the model can be improved. And I think, uh, yeah, we're pretty close to having that now. We're actually hoping to present that in about a week and a half from now at a, another conference. Um, but yeah, like that's, that's something that we were kind of looking at in a comment that we got quite a bit. Awesome. Thank you. I'm curious, do you all normally win your like fantasy football leagues? <laughs> uh, we're all well, in one together, all one together that just <laughs> finished its first week and it was a bit rough for some of us. <laughs> <laughs> what other slide on new model? <laughs> yeah. But the answer is yes, we usually win. <laughs> okay. <laughs> one of the other question was at any point during the project, did you feel like you hit a roadblock? Yeah, uh, well, I, I mean, like with our projects, really, for when we started in September, we didn't really work on it super, super hard until December when our courses ended. Um, like, because we had a couple of like very difficult courses to go through that were sucking up a lot of our time. Uh, so once we got through that, uh, there were a couple days where I was thinking like, man, are we going to get it done in time? Um, and there were a few things like trying to find out say the penalized expected arrival time algorithm, trying to find ways to actually do that. It, it took a little while to really think through it and come up with an algorithm to actually do that. Um, yeah, that, I guess that's the one roadblock that came to mind, that and just school kind of getting in the way. But yeah, yeah, I think, I don't know if you guys have anything to add there. Yeah, I remember, uh, I, think it was, I think it was due on like the 7th of January or something. And I remember January 4th, we realized that we had calculated something completely wrong. So the overnight, running the code overnight that Robin talked about, we had to redo three days before it was, uh, before it was due. <laughs> um, so that was a little bit stressful, um, but uh, ha happy, we, happy we turned it around and, and made it work. That's great. So... I know you've mentioned like forming your team with like diverse backgrounds is really important. I'm wondering for people who maybe are working in like different industries right now, but are also super interested in sports and big datable, if you have any suggestions for like meeting people that could possibly be part of their team. Um, I'll maybe, yeah. So for the big data bowl, I think we typically stay SFU, um, but like stuff for the big data cup, um, like maybe Brendan, you can talk about how you formed your big data cup team because that's different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, like Robin was mentioning for this one, I just emailed all the students who were interested in sports and we formed a team. But for the big data cup, 
I just met my teammates online, like on Twitter. So I think Twitter is a great resource for sports analytics because there's so many people on there just sharing their ideas through blogs or through videos and just various forms of media. Um, so I, I think that's a great way to kind of get involved and like interact with other people who are in the industry and trying to get into the industry. Um, and yeah, I, I literally just uh, met one of my teammates online through Twitter. And then we said, hmm, how are we going to get other people? Then we emailed one guy that he knew and then that was three. Then we thought, oh man, we need maybe someone with a bit more of like a strong statistical background because at the time I was just finishing my undergrad and the other two guys were more of like hockey oriented guys. So then we just reached out to a guy who went to the same university as my other teammate and he happened to be in, he was a PhD at McGill. Uh, and then now he's, <laughs> I'm working with him directly in my internship. So uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of like, like he was a big help to that. And without him, we probably wouldn't have gotten that done. So yeah, like it just ended up just snowballing from just being on Twitter and meeting one guy and then meeting other people from that. And then that turned into the big data cup, and then internships from there. Yeah, definitely. If you want to get started, um, I'd recommend like getting on Twitter and play around with any kind of data that you can get your hands on and just share it. Like the community is huge for sports analytics on Twitter and we'll shout out sports dataverse, which I know you've had on here before, like follow them on Twitter. There's so many people in that community who, who would help lift each other up and, and support any project or questions that you might have. That's great. I know um, Sam from Sports Dataverse was on a bit earlier. He might be on now too, if you wanna share the link in tw um, to the Twitter as well. I know you also mentioned like a, a great idea is to look at other sports to get ideas and to do brainstorming. Um, what did you look at or what other sports data were you working with? Probably the most publicly available with some tracking data. So like tracking data is very hidden and not a lot of people share it. So it's like amazing that the NFL is doing this. Um, so all the other big data bowls will have some tracking data, a lot of them. And then soccer is a huge one that has tracking data and like properly published papers using it, explaining all the stuff that works. So I think soccer is one of the biggest ones to, to look at. Um, and then the Big Data Cup recently, this year started using tracking data. So all those papers and that data is publicly available, um, supported by staff leads who made the data from broadcast video. Um, so just get your hands on stuff and do what you can. Great, thank you. I think there's one more question that I realized I missed from earlier. Um, and it was, sounds like you're running the code locally. Were there any specific roadblocks to offloading that to the cloud or was that just not really necessary? So yeah, like all the code ended up going on my computer uh, for the most part, like uh, other than Eli and Riker stuff, they, I think they managed to get it done, but uh, I think I helped them run a bit of code, but like uh, we, like my computer was just strong enough to do what we needed and it was an overnight process. So I had to like, just let it run overnight, but um, the optimal path algorithm and everything, it wasn't too computationally exhaustive where we had to go to the cloud or anything like that. Um, yeah, the only issue I guess was just time-wise with running all of it, but we basically just stuck to one play at a time when we were testing things out. So uh, that, I don't think that was really a, too much of a problem for us. And yeah, we didn't really have to go to the cloud for anything. Yeah, we were probably on the borderline of like, should we switch to the cloud and put in all that effort or should we just send it to Brendan and hopefully it'll run in time. So we probably could have gone either way. Although there's also like, you know, big costs going to the cloud, especially when you have like over three gigs of data. So I think that was definitely, we didn't know we were gonna win. So <laughs> that's a consideration. Yeah, and the and then once once the data was cleaned up, like Brendan mentioned, we were able to just run like one play at a time, which wasn't too which wasn't too computationally heavy. Um, but once we got the data cleaned for the model, then like we it really cut down on the size of it. Um, and then that was after that we were kind of good to go. Cool. And that shiny app that's just on is that just on shiny apps.io today? Yeah. 
Awesome. Sounds like a great uh, shiny submission for the shiny contest. <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll have to add some updates and see what we can do. Well, thank you all so much for, for joining us all here today and answering all our questions. Really appreciate you sharing your experience with us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank Congra you. Congratulations awesome. again. And uh, thank you all so much for joining too. Just a reminder, um, if you ever have suggestions or want to present at a future meetup, I'll share those links where you can um, upload suggestions or meet up topics in the recording. And the recording will be the same exact YouTube link that you accessed it at today. Um, but thank you all again so much for joining. Have a great rest of the day, everybody.